Are you looking for a new job? Are you hiring but can't find diverse, talented candidates? Then we have something that can help, our job board. Just head on over to revisionpath.com forward slash jobs to browse listings or to place your own. This week on the job board, Work & Co. is looking for a senior developer in Portland, Oregon, and a senior QA analyst in Brooklyn, New York. The University of Delaware is looking for an assistant professor for their art and design department in Newark, Delaware. The University of Texas at Austin is looking for an assistant professor of practice in integrated design for their College of Fine Arts in Austin, Texas. And Bandcamp is looking for a user experience designer. This is a remote position. For just $99, we will feature your listing on our job board for 30 days and help spread the word about it to our audience of listeners. We also offer an annual job board subscription for companies and organizations. Make sure to head over to revisionpath.com forward slash jobs for more information on these listings and others. Apply today and tell them you heard about the job through Revision Path. Get started with us and expand your job search today. Revisionpath.com forward slash jobs. You're listening to the Revision Path Podcast, a weekly showcase of the world's black graphic designers, web designers, and web developers. Through in-depth interviews, you'll learn about their work, their goals, and what inspires them as creative individuals. Here's your host, Maurice Cherry. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Revision Path. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm your host, Maurice Cherry. And before we get into this week's interview, I want to take some time out and thank our accessibility sponsor for this episode, Brevity & Wit. Brevity & Wit is a strategy and design firm committed to designing a more inclusive and equitable world. They accomplish this through graphic design, presentations, and workshops around IDEA, inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility. If you're curious to learn how to combine a passion for IDEA with design, Check them out at brevityandwit.com. Brevity and Wit. Creative excellence without the grind. Now for this week's interview. I'm talking with Don Okoro, an artist living in Austin, Texas. Let's start the show. All right, so tell us who you are and what you do. My name is Don Okoro, and I'm an artist. Most of my art has been painting. I paint people, mostly Black women and, and bright, vivid colors. And I also am really influenced a lot by fashion. So I like to incorporate fashion into my art and um, just have fashion as art. And I also uh, do some video work as well as art. So I, I like to, to experiment with, with different mediums of art. Nice. How has the year been going for you so far? How's 2021 been? 2021 has been, it was currently a, a year of transition for me. When it comes to art, last year for me in 2020, things kind of just got really, really busy. Like things were slow when the pandemic first hit, but then things got busier with, you know, with some different projects coming up. And then I've been able to reach more people in, in the past year and I've sold a lot more paintings than before. And so I left my day job that I had been working for nine years and, and just focusing on art full time. And yeah, things are, a lot of things are changing for me in 2021. Congratulations on uh, leaving the job and becoming a full time artist. Thank you. Is there anything that you kind of want to try to accomplish before the end of the year? I mean, it sounds like it's been going pretty well so far. Really, the biggest thing that I'd like to accomplish is just finish a couple of projects that I have going on. One of the changes that happened for me this year is that I signed with, uh, well, I started working with a couple of galleries, like where they represent my work. And what one of the galleries that I signed with is based in London. They also have a, a gallery in L.A. Next year, I'm going to have a solo show with them at their London location. But I need to get all those works finished as soon as possible, or well, probably won't be till the end of the year. But my goal is to get get all those pieces finished and then I can kind of breathe a sigh of relief. <laughs> oh, nice. London is really nice. I need to get back to London when all this pandemic stuff is over with, but no, that's great. I mean, so you just got the representation this year. You just became represented. Yeah. Yeah. This year, the gallery in London called Maddox gallery. And then there's also a gallery in Seattle called Copland del Rio, which I have a solo show with them right now of 
of some small drawings um, that I did out of made with, with Kool Aid this summer. Oh yeah, I saw on Instagram this new drawing you're doing called Red Forty with Kool Aid. That's really cool. Thanks. Yeah, it's, it's been fun to work with. I just figured, you know, and this is you know thinking about just over the past year, like how I've been reaching more towards things that that are comforting and. And I was trying to think of a way to incorporate that into my art. And for me, Kool-Aid, like, it's something that we grew up having with, I, I don't know, probably most mills is, uh, you know, growing up, you know, here in Lubbock, Texas. It's something, I guess, once I got moved out of the house, it's not something that I just, you know, sit and make. But I guess you could say just the smell of it just is, it brings back, like, a n- nostalgic feeling. And so I got several packets of, of different colors and decided, well, why don't I try to use that kind of, like, as a like a watercolor. And so I experimented with that a few months ago. And it's interesting. It, actually, it doesn't really act like watercolor. It's, it's definitely different, but it's interesting. And it, and it, you can really play with the textures um, and the grit of the, the powder as well. So yeah, I ended up doing a whole series of those drawings. I'm curious, does it smell? Yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> it smells like when you first open up the packet, of course, like the powder kind of gets under your nose and it's strong. And then, but then when I paint with it, I do the drawings in color pencil, but then I painted the Kool-Aid around, on and around the drawing. And so when I paint with the Kool-Aid, I mix it with water. And depending on how much water you mix it with, that will that'll determine how dark it is. So I you know, did, did a few of these with the Kool-Aid. And then I came into my studio the next day and you could really smell the Kool-Aid, you know, strong. And it was just like, I, I like the way Kool-Aid smells. Like if my mother is making it, you know, before a meal and we're, and we're having it with the meal, but but to have this the smell of the powder just in the studio was just like, ah, it's too much. But yeah. But what I do to protect the drawing is I spray it with an acrylic coating. And once mm-hmm. I spray that, then, then you can't smell it anymore. Yeah, I was just thinking, I was like, I wonder if that like holds up over transport. Like, are people trying to, will people try to get close to try to <laughs> smell the Kool-Aid or something? But no, yeah, that's really it interesting. Doesn't, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> so what do your days look like now that you're a full-time artist? Well, first, I'll tell you what my days kind of look like before. So, you know, I have my job, you know, that I would go to. It's about at least nine hours a day. Do that. So when it came to my art, like I just had to find a way to just fit it around that no matter what I had going on. So, you know, I would work and then ideally come home and then just get right to work on my painting, which, you know, ideally maybe for a few hours. That didn't always happen, of course. And then Sometimes if I had, if I had like a big project coming up, I would be like, you know, take a vacation from my day job to to then go work on art. It was just really hard to balance it, especially if I had like a, a big, a really big project where it involved like a, a lot of painting. And I just really wanted to just dedicate that time to making my art. So now that I'm I'm able to focus on my art, it's I will say that those hours that I worked at my day job, like those immediately you know got filled up with like plenty to do. Like it still feels like there aren't enough hours in a day, but my days look like I, I get up, make some coffee on the perfect day. I would you know get up and maybe work out for like 30 minutes, which for me might mean like skateboarding or, you know, go for a walk or something. And then, and then when I get home, shower, freshen up and then get, you know, get into the art studio. So when I'm in the studio, I try to divide my days up so that I have at least a couple days a week where I deal with like business related stuff, you know, that that's not making art. And then, then I would like, ideally, like, I try to have at least three days a week where it's just focused on actually making stuff. It doesn't always work, work out that way, but just spend my day in the studio, either you know, at my computer, you know, doing paperwork or doing stuff like that or working on a canvas or a drawing, but definitely much happier now, <laughs> for sure. Yeah, I can imagine like trying to juggle a full-time job while also having these, you know, sort of side responsibilities is always tough balance because, I mean, you would hope that, you know, you land at a job that sort of understands that, like, outside of work, you're a a totally different person. You have your own other, you know, sorts of things that you have to do. Or did you find that your job was kind of sympathetic to that? My bosses were were sympathetic to that, but at the same time, it was like, there's really not much they could really do, you know, not much they could really do to help because, you know, the way I felt, I, w- you know, I wish that, I don't know, I wish I could maybe, I don't know, have a schedule that maybe like, you know, like the like the four tens or just a schedule where you have more days off or something. I don't know. But they really just really, they weren't able to do that, at least in my department. And like, so it's really, they were sympathetic and they sort of, I guess, supported me as an artist. But like, but that's about, you know, but there's really not much they could do because it's just, 
a big corporate job and they just, you know, you just have to work with whatever, you know, whatever they provide. So, yeah. And you were working at a news station, right? Yeah, I was a journalist um, at that station. I was a well, I was a producer for several years there, but that was really stressful because you're the producer that handles writing for the shows, like when the anchor comes on and talks, and then you also have to sit in the booth and like booth the show too. And to me, that's nerve wracking when you have like live shots and just so many moving parts and things can, can go wrong. And I think that probably wasn't best suited for that kind of position in the first place, but just because I get so anxious, but it made me, I really hated that part of the job. There were some good things about being a TV news producer, but eventually there was an opportunity to join the the web team. So I, I jumped on that and I was Definitely a lot, a lot happier. At least that, that was more tolerable to work on the web team because it's just, the pace is different. Like you know, there's a story breaks, so you get all the information and you post it. You know, that's and then you do updates, and that's pretty much all you can really do. You know, on that and post on social media. So I, I definitely enjoyed that better. But still, I just I wanted to have those hours, you know, for myself and my art. Yeah. And again, congratulations to you on making that jump. I know, you know, we're recording this right now at a time where there's this, you know, there's this big thing going on, and at least what the media is calling, like the great resignation of people deciding they're going to leave their jobs and pursue other things. And not saying that what you're doing is wrapped up in that, but I think it certainly speaks to the sort of overall wave right now of people discovering like there's more out there than just a nine to five, like you'd have the permission and the, the the capacity to pursue your passions, which is, which is great for, you know, anyone that has an artistic kind of soul like that. Yeah. And I definitely, I, I agree with that. And I think being able to work, a lot of people that weren't allowed to work from home were suddenly allowed to work from home. And I think that made a difference as well. Like at my job, like we were, we worked in an office, but in me as a, as a producer or web producer, you know, or digital whatever you want to call it. Like I really didn't have any need to physically be in the office. And before the pandemic, you know, we were, you know, some of us were like, Hey, could we work from home or at least have some, like just some days a week where we can work from home and the company's like, no. And then the pandemic happens and then they allow suddenly like pretty much everyone's allowed to work from home. Unless you're like, you know, if you're the anchor in the studio, like this kind of hard to do from home, but so they had to have some people like in the control room and all that. But this whole time, like I was able to work from home and that that was nice just to even if I had to focus on my day job from home, it was nice just to at least be near my art. So as soon as I was done working, then I could just it was like, well, I'm already here. At least I don't have to go through the commute and all that. But then I heard this isn't why I quit. But shortly after I quit, I learned that, like, um, I think starting soon, like everybody that, <laughs> that was working from home, like get ready to get back in the office. You know, and I was like, oh, God, I'm so glad that I'm not. Not there anymore because I I would not want to you know have to go back to the office like every single day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to get back to to your your artwork again, you mentioned earlier you kind of working across a bunch of different medium in terms of inspiration. You know, some of it is fashion based, some of it is more fine arts based, like you mentioned with this painting. How do you approach creating a new piece of art? Like, where does that start? Yeah, it starts off with just how do I feel. From there, like, what kind of work do, do I want to create or, you know, what is it for? Or and usually, all that, you know, that's usually that's going to be I want to I want to do some paintings or I want to do a painting and then I paint people. So then from there, it's like, who will I paint a lot during the past year and a half? I've been doing self portraits because that's just been a lot easier, you know, during the pandemic. And I've just slowly started to get back into having people photograph for me so that I can use that image as a, as a reference. So then, you know, it's just deciding who will I paint? What will this painting look like? How do I want people to feel? And then I, you know, I photograph the person and then I will later go look at the photographs from there and decide. I look and see what kind of touches me the most emotionally. And then I use that, that image as the reference image. And then, so then I, a painting, the colors are also very feeling based, you know, based on this person, what are they wearing? Then I just go from there. And then when it's finished, I hope that I create something that they can move people in some way. Yeah, I saw from looking at, you know, like I said, some of the, the past work that you've done and even looking at the process around it, it seems like it's it's kind of collaborative in that way. Like you 
are working with a model or working with someone to kind of conjure up the emotion that you want to eventually put forth in the piece? Yes, I like to be able to, to capture the the essence of the person that's modeling. Whenever I'm late, well, at least lately, the past few years, whenever I'm going to bring someone in to, to shoot reference photos with, I'll tell them just you know just wear wear whatever you want want to wear. You can bring a couple of outfits if you want, and then when they get here, then I'll see what they're wearing, and so it's kind of like a surprise for me. And so some people it might it might be t-shirt and jeans, others might have more of an elaborate type of getup. It's fun for me to be surprised by what they're wearing and then and then just for me to just kind of spin off from that. Hmm. I saw I think it was your your punk noir exhibit where you also had a band there. So it's it's Mm -hmm. it's exhibiting your work, but then you also have this kind of live media component, too. Yeah. um, So that the punk noir show started in here in Austin. I was thinking, okay, so when they said, okay, you can you can do a solo show here. What do you want to do? And at that time, I was just really just getting back into being an artist again. And through that process, I was starting to meet more artists around town, like some of them who didn't even live here maybe a few years ago. But I was just starting to get more involved and meet other creatives. And I just wanted to just capture a snapshot of the way things felt here in Austin at that time for me and and the the bike creative community. So so for the show, I wanted to paint these life-size portraits of people that black people that have a punk spirit. And then I, I envision at least for the opening, I have, you have a a black fronted punk band there and just really make it an an immersive night. And so it really was like, I would say it was probably about 400 people at at the opening and you have got lots of video and like people, you know, everyone moshed into the the punk band and, and the, the part where the paintings were, I guess that's like, I was kind of like a few steps away from where the band performed, but you can kind of hear it coming into the gallery area. So that, that was such a, a good experience. I wanted to recreate that. So I had some opportunities to show in a few other locations around that time. So I was like, well, let me bring Punk Noir to these locations. So I was able to do the show in Dallas. And there I was able to have a band as well. In Dallas, I had Wands Dover. And then in Austin, I had Black Black Exploitation was the the band. But the thing is, this all takes funding. And, you know, so I had another version of the Punk Noir show in, in San Antonio, Texas, and also in Seattle, but I wasn't able to bring the bands to those, unfortunately, because we didn't have the the funding and resources there. You know? <laughs> mm-hmm. Now, when you're thinking about, you know, kind of creating these exhibits, do you always want to have that kind of, I guess, live component to it? Or was it just specific for that one? I would say it's specific to that one, but that was so fun that if in the future, when I'm able to, again, I could definitely see myself doing that again. But it just all comes down to having the support to, to be able to do that. But I would definitely do, do something like that again. Yeah, like I would think, you know, some London musicians in the show. That would be dope. That would be awesome. <laughs> yeah, I have to see about that. <laughs> now, you're originally from Texas. You also are currently, I mean, you live in Texas now, too. Tell me about what it was like growing up there. So Texas, it's it's a very big state. Very vast, you know, eat different areas are different from each other. So I live in Austin now, which is like the capital of Texas. Austin is a very, well, Texas is, is a red state, you know, very conservative. Austin is a blue, very blue area. I guess the, the major cities are, are blue, but then the rest of Texas is like rural and very red. I grew up in Lubbock, Texas, which is about, it's in what we call the Texas panhandle, but it's like up north like in the panhandle part that sticks out in Texas. Um, mm-hmm. And it's about a six hour drive from Austin. Lubbock is a lot different from Austin. Um, it's very flat, very conservative. Um, it's now, I guess it's like Trump country. <laughs> Austin is very white. Lubbock is very, it's very white too. I guess it just has such a conservative attitude overall. Like I think a lot of my upbringing was influenced by that. And I just wanted to just get away as soon as I could, because I was already someone that just because of just how I am, like very introverted, you know, very shy. I think that that didn't help, but I just didn't feel like I, I fit in really anywhere. So I just got out of love as soon as I could. Hmm. I know that feeling. I grew up in a, a small town in Alabama and 
two weeks after I graduated, I was out. I was like, I'm, yeah, I'm yeah, done. Exactly. This was, this was fun. Thanks. I'm out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I hear you. I hear you. So I moved to Austin for college. I'm just really glad that I did. Just to see something else, even if Austin was not like, you know, a huge city or anything, it was just good to to just experience something else. Yeah. Were you exposed to a lot of art and, and everything growing up in Lubbock? Like, was there like an art scene there? I don't know if there was an art scene, really. I mean, I, as far as art, like the only museum that I went to was we have Texas Tech in Lubbock. So I would, you know, go to the Texas Tech Museum, like whenever we go for like a field trip at school. But other than that, that's, yeah, that's pretty much, that's pretty much it. I mean, Lubbock at that time may may have had a few, maybe a few galleries, but I will say one memory I I have is being in high school and I'm not sure how I met this artist, but this, I met an artist who was a, who was an older Hispanic artist who had a studio in downtown Lubbock, not far from my high school. And I remember I, I visited there one time and, and I was just, he had all his, artwork up and then he was working on stuff in his studio and that was really in- inspiring for me even though at that time I still still didn't feel like for sure I could be a successful artist but but now looking back that's a good memory one of the rare times that I got to be around someone that had an art studio there in Lubbock. And now once you left and, and went to University of uh, of Texas in Austin I mean was that like a big culture shift? Not really um, it was just Given the timing, you know, being 18 and finally, you know, moving off on my own, I, I think it was just a just a shift in my life of just learn just learning how to just be an, an adult. But I, I'm glad that I got to spend those years in in Austin as opposed to to Lubbock. But I was just mainly I was pretty much kept myself confined to the confined to campus. Then here in Austin, like we have a, our entertainment area is called Sixth Street. So, I would, you know, go to Sixth Street with some, with some of my, my classmates and, and all that. But it wasn't too much of a culture change just because Austin was, at the time especially, wasn't, it was more of a, just a sleepy college town. So, so it was, you know, a good, good place to start off, I guess, you know, leaving Lubbock. <laughs> what was your time like there at UT? Looking back, I wish, I hate to say shoulda, coulda, woulda, but I wish that I had, taking advantage of, of the resources that they would have for someone that wants to be an artist. I knew at, when I initially went to started going to college, I knew that I wanted to be an artist or something creative. But I was like, man, I'll, I'll just put that off till later. And like expectations of myself and expectations from family. And, you know, it's pretty much expected that I would be like a doctor or a lawyer or hmm. engineer or something like that. And so I was like, well, I could, could just do that all. I'll just, I'll just pick another major that sounds legit. And I, I picked psychology <laughs> and then I minored in fashion design. I took you know a whole lot of fashion design classes, the most fun on the fashion design side of things. So I don't know. I just feel like I, I wish if I could go back and change things, I probably would have just maybe studied art and fashion design instead. But I would just kind of like not as focused on what I would do as so much so as some other people I know that kind of, knew what they wanted to do, had everything lined up, had their internships and then a job or something right out of college. And, you know, that, that wasn't me. Mm. Well, I mean, I think we all have, there's non-traditional paths to get into the arts or into design or things like that. But I, I see what you mean about kind of looking back at college and wishing that, you know, or wondering like if you pursued things in a different manner where you might be now, like, for example, I'm a designer. I also work as a strategist. But like in undergrad, I majored in math. Now, I love math. Don't get me wrong. I was a <laughs> huge math nerd in high school. I was captain of the That's math, awesome. math leaks and everything. But I wanted to, I was also a writer. Like I wrote all through grade school or whatever. And I remember wanting to go off to college and major in English. And my mom was like, nope, mm-mm. Like you need to major in something that's like going to make some money. And like she knew that I was into computers and everything. And so I initially mm-hmm. I started off doing computer engineering, computer science. And then I didn't like that for like a semester and then switched over to math. Now, the school that I went to didn't have an arts program, really. It had an art class and you could take some of the, like if you wanted to pursue art, I think you could take some of them at a nearby college. So like I went to Morehouse, but like you could take art classes at Spelman because Spelman had, or they still have, I should say, a museum, but they have a very rigorous 
art program. If you wanted to pursue that, you could just take all your classes at Spelman. Mm-hmm. And I didn't even really think about that because I knew that if I did that, I would lose my scholarship because my scholarship was in STEM fields. And so math was kind of the compromise for me because I really liked math. And there's, I mean, truth be told, there actually is a, is a good bit of design in math when you're drawing and doing 3D curves and stuff. But like, I didn't really get to that until much later in, in the major. But I do wonder sometimes, like, if I would have just pursued art and went that way, like, what would be different? Like, I don't, I don't begrudge the path that I've taken now, but I do wonder, mm-hmm. like, would that be different in that way? Yeah. Yeah. Same here. Same here. Cause I, I feel like as someone that's mostly a, a painter, like, there, at some point I felt like, I, and I felt the vibe that I was getting was that, like, an, an MFA is, is so important. And, you know, like, it's, it's like you, are expected to have an MFA. And by that time I'd already, I didn't have money to get an MFA because I already blown all my loans on these other, <laughs> other mm-hmm. degrees. Uh, and so that, that wasn't going to happen. And so, but over time, like I'm seeing like it, it really, there are very few things where that I want to do where have not having an MFA is a barrier to that. So I'm, I'm glad that at least the, the experiences that I have had in my career kind of help, you know, just help make me, make me who I am and, I'm able you know, to still continue forward and doing what I want to do with art. And I mean, continuing along the, the education path, like later you ended up going to law school also. Mm-hmm. Was that sort of part of your interest back then? No, it was never, it was never my interest. Like I, it was more so, you know, like in college, it was like I majored in psychology, just kind of biding my time. You know, Cause I don't know, I guess at, at, well, at some point I was pre, you know, pre-med in my undergrad and then, I started taking those chemistry classes and I was like, okay, this isn't going to work. <laughs> so I got my psychology degree. And then after that, it was like, okay, so now I have my, my bachelor's degree. I know I want to do stuff creative, but for now I, I need to have something going on in my life or, you know, I don't have a career or anything. And so I was like, okay, well, I'll just go to law school. That's, that's not, you know, just, you just take the LSAT and you can go to law school with, with any degree. And so I was like, okay, I'll just, do that. So basically I apply, I was like, okay, I'll just take the LSAT, apply to one school <laughs> and leave it at that. You know, I got that down, I'll get in. And then I applied, then got the acceptance letter. Crap. <laughs> you know. <laughs> so I got the acceptance letter and I was like, just, oh God, I, I just cannot do this. Um, I wanted to be an artist. So, so I wrote the school and, and asked them if they could defer my acceptance. So they just they said, okay, we can we can defer it for a year, and and so I was like, okay, I'll take that year to just finally make myself successful as an artist, and then I won't need to go to law school. <laughs> so that year, I really did work on my art, and that's when I really really started pursuing it professionally. That's when I just put on my own art show, and it did go well, you know, considering. But then the year went by, and my expectations were not realistic either, but. Mm. I still wasn't like able to make a living from art. So it was like, okay, I'll just go ahead and go to law school. And, and that's what I did. I was like, well, let me just do that. So I could just become a lawyer. And then, then I'll just be an artist, you know, on the side. Mm-hmm. So in law school, I mean, law school is you know very, very demanding, especially if you don't, if it's not your passion to be a lawyer, I think that makes it, makes it harder and, you know, less <laughs> fun to do. I mean, it, it's interesting. And, yeah, you know, I, you know, learned some things and that was a, cool experience and I met some met some good people that I'm still in touch with but law school itself I mean it was just um not the most fun experience but there is something that about that that kind of about going to law school that was a positive impact on my art going to law school I went to Texas Southern in Houston and Houston at the time I felt like Houston had a really vibrant art scene more so compared to more than Austin I guess you know the Houston art scene was I don't know, it's more culturally rich and there was just stronger representation of black artists and artists of color being, you know, seen and shown. And so there I was able to get involved in the art scene and I was showing my work there and I met a couple of artists who who are still mentors for me today. So so the best part about law school was just be just I guess is it made me move to Houston temporarily, mm-hmm. but I graduated from law school. And at that time I was just like, okay, I know I don't want to do this. I have nothing to lose. And so I just, um, just decided at that time, I'm not going to pursue law. I'm just going to now be an artist. And so right after I graduated from law school, then I, I me along with my boyfriend, we, we just moved to New York. Um, you know, we didn't really have anything to lose. 
that was a an interesting experience too. But we did end up back in Texas, and that's when I ended up becoming a journalist for for many years. So it's it's kind of like a roller coaster of doing art and then stopping art, doing art, stopping art. Yeah, I'm curious, and this kind of feeds into my next question. But do you feel like once you went through this, went through law school and being in Houston, many things, do you feel like this gave you permission now to be an artist? Yeah, I, I do. I do. Especially at that time, because, I mean, after just, just going through law school, I figure, okay, at least I did it. I finished. Hopefully, you know, my family will be proud of that. <laughs> and mm-hmm. um, But now it's like, okay, at this point, I'm, I'm like 29 years old. I was just like, okay, I'm this, okay now I'm just going to do, do my own thing, which is art. But then I just felt like, well, I'm just still not getting to where I want to be fast enough. That's how I felt at that time. Now, looking back, like, I, I just... I should have had more, more patience, but I just decided, okay, well, I, I just want to get my life together and just have some stability. So that's when I got a job as a journalist and then just, and that was after moving back from New York. And so I was feeling like discouraged being back in Texas. And let me tell you what else, like when I lived in New York, we ended up having to c- come back to Texas. It was just a, a bad time to really move to New York, economic recession, all that. But coming back to Texas meant I moved right back to Lubbock, at least for a while. So it was, just a, it was, that was a, a huge culture shift going from New York to Lubbock where it just like my life just felt like it came to like a screeching halt. And so I was just really, mm. really upset about it. And, you know, depressed at the time. And I was just like, I'm just going to give, I'm just going to give up on art. And, and, and then I just focused on my journalism career and, and I started doing more in that. And, and there was some, some good times, you know, working as a journalist and I, some things I enjoyed and, yeah, and then so I was just like I was just focusing on my, my nine to five, and then when I would be, get off of work instead of making art, then it's like okay, I have that that free time to just just chill and you know decompress or or whatever. But but over time, I just realized like I was just kind of going through the motions and just kind of watching my life pass me by, and I wasn't really happy. And, that, and that's when I you know decided okay, I, I need to get back into art and just and just continue to do that. Yeah, and like and like you're saying, it kind of sounds like this also kind of took place right around the time you're like leaving your twenties, entering your thirties, wondering Mm -hmm. like, is this, is this right? Like, is this the the path that I'm supposed to be taking? You know? Exactly. Exactly. It was just like, okay, damn, I'm I'm 30. Like, what do I, and I, it's easier for me to to look at, look at it differently now. You know, yeah, I was just feeling kind of frantic. I just didn't have like, I guess a career really and, and all that. And so I was just trying to get, just get some, like, at least some financial stability, which, you know, which we were at that time, like, just just working and just, you know, building up. You know, I, I can't really say that that was not the right way to go about things. You know, I could have gone about it differently, but, you know, like, I, it's nice just to have at least, you know, your basic needs taken care of. And then it's, then it's easier for me to be creative. Yeah. The reason that I was saying that this might feed into my next question is because I wanted to to ask you about this solo exhibition that you did last year called burden of respectability because as you've sort of described all of this that the word respectability or or the concept of respectability politics kind of popped into my head and i'm wondering like as you did the solo exhibition did that sort of conjure up these past feelings of of feeling like you had to go along this certain path in your life and in your career instead of becoming an artist earlier on when I was putting together that show, I don't remember thinking specifically about my, my situation with my path to being an artist. But now that you say that, I, I, that probably, deep down, that probably had had some impact on that. I mean, I was thinking about m- myself and just Black people in America in, in general, like how you're just sort of, ex- in some segments, I guess, of society expected to act or behave a certain way, you know, so that you're you can show that you're you're good. You're one of the good ones, you know? And and so when I did this show, this was like this fall of 2020. So, so the pandemic, you know, height of the pandemic, I had an opportunity to do a show in a, in a window. So it would just be a a window display. So I thought, okay, that's, that's a great idea with the pandemic. Anyone could just come by and see the work without having to be close to anybody or even go indoors. And I always loved seeing the window displays in New York, like on Fifth Avenue and all that. And 
just how just watching how that is an art in itself doing a, a merchandising <laughs> display. So I figured I wanted to do something like that with my art. And so I've been wearing these headpieces because I, I just like them for, for fashion. And so I decided to make some headpieces that would sit on top of mannequin heads and for the display. And then there would also be, be lighting where there'd be like a purple light that shines on the mannequins and, and splashes onto the onto the background. So I made these head chains well out of copper chains. And then I used different gemstones and they were heavy. So when I finished each headpiece and then each headpiece was, was heavy. And so it kind of kind of weighs down on the the mannequin's head, but that's to kind of show that the weight, the weight of that burden of, of respectability. Mm-hmm. And so just trying to show the weight, but also just trying to, well, also trying to create something that's aesthetically appealing to, you know, to whoever might be walking by and viewing that window. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a strong metaphor. I mean, I think historically when people think about, to kind of give you a sense, we'll put a link to it in the show notes so people can kind of see the window and see what I'm talking about. But like, it's these heads on pikes, essentially, which like historically have have meant like a warning <laughs> in a way. Yeah. So, so like when I was looking at the images, I'm thinking like, oh, this is like an omen. Like the burden of respectability is like you end up like this. Yeah, like I I, I had to, to think, OK, how will I display the, these these headpieces and so I got these styrofoam heads, um, and they're, they're really lightweight, and I painted painted them black. And then on some of the faces of the, of the heads, I I um, put bits of like copper leaf um, over the over the eyes and things like that. Yeah, like the the thing I had to display them on was this metal pole or stake kind of, and then the styrofoam is so lightweight that you can just like just kind of smash the styrofoam on there. And I and I noticed like when I did that, kind of it kind of looked like a a chopped off head that's just kind of dangling there. So yeah, I could I could definitely see where you're coming from on that. And now those head pieces that you were creating are those similar to the one that you wear now, like the one that I've seen in recent photos. The one that I've been wearing in most photos is is one that I I bought a while back, and I li- liked it so much I decided I wanted to to make start making my own, which I still have some some more ideas that I want to work on. But I kind of use use this headpiece kind of like as a as a pattern, just like how the the crown is made, mm-hmm. and so I you know make something similar, and then I looped you know looped the metal on in, in a similar way, but then I from there I can kind of play with how much chain or how long or, or if you want to attach any other materials and, and things like that. Yeah, the ones that that you're wearing, I love those. Like it it gives a very like rock star kind of feel to your image. It's I don't know. I was describing it. So a friend of mine earlier, I was like, it's sort of like a medieval circlet, but then it's also mm-hmm. giving me like, like Rick James. I love yeah. it. It's great. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of like, um, I started, you know, I, I put it on, I was like, I like this. And, and I was like, and it kind of ended up becoming, it's like my wig. I even had, had it on tonight, today. I, I don't know if this, I thought this was going to be on video. So I had it ready for you. <laughs> oh, <laughs> we'll have your image for the cover art so people can see that. <laughs> okay, cool. Wow. <laughs> sort of, you know, speaking to, to what we we're talking about before, and I mentioned this before we started recording, I love that you really use social media to kind of give a glimpse into just like your artistic world. Like you're on Twitter, you're on Instagram, you're on TikTok, which I've recently been getting into TikTok. That's a very interesting place, TikTok. <laughs> and then of course, YouTube, you have, uh, a series that you have called Life and Art, where you have all these videos, like there's a video on your first museum solo show. There's a recent video you did around anxiety and being an artist. Like, how does social media really help out with what you do? Well, for me, for me, social media has has been a, a huge, huge help, even going way, way back to before I went to law school. Back then, MySpace was the thing. And so, you know, I would get on MySpace, post my artwork. And like, even with that, I guess maybe MySpace wasn't as bad at that time with like algorithms and all that. And I'm thinking the reach was probably more organic because it was just easier to, I don't know, it just felt seemed like it was easier to meet other people through that platform, you know, especially meeting other artists. And even back then on MySpace, like I was meeting collectors other artists who became mentors, curators, and then looking at present day, I 
I do post on Instagram a lot. Um, that's really my main one because it's the more visual one, I guess, you know, good for posting photos, I guess. But when I started, when I did my punk noir show, the first version of it in Austin, I just start, I started just documenting the process like about six months before just, you know, each, not every day, but several days a week just post, here's what I'm working on today. Here's what's going on now. Or here's the, this challenge that I'm going through. And, but then, you know, six months later, then when they show up and then a lot of people have, have been following that whole process and, you know, they felt, they, I guess they felt like, okay, they, they felt that they were with me and in, in, in sort of like in a way, and I've had some, you know, some collectors say that they really enjoyed just seeing the process of me ma- making a specific painting. And also just when I show what I have go- going on, other artists can, can see what I'm doing and what I'm dealing with and they can relate and helps them feel less alone as well. But really, you know, even still today, Instagram is where I still meet collectors, curators, people that that run museums or that run galleries. The initial connection might be Instagram. Like, you know, they have an account, too, and they're following and they're like, I like this person. And so they, they, they may reach out through a DM or, or through email, but it's still been a great way to just to just meet people in the world that, that are interested in my art. Hmm. Yeah, I know that there are certainly listeners that have written us and have asked, like, we want to see from more people that are, like, using, I think, more social platforms. And that's not to say that Instagram is not a social platform. It totally is. But I'm really intrigued by how you use TikTok because, you know, like I alluded to, it is a very interesting platform. Like, I just started really exploring it, I don't know, maybe about a month or so ago. There's a spirit about TikTok that reminds me very much of like the early, early, early web, like late 90s, early 2000s, where it's unfettered in terms of what you can talk about and everything. But in the same vein, it's also like weirdly regulated. I mean, of course, heavily so in terms of certain like things you would mention in terms of topics, but I'll hear about people getting banned if their account reaches a certain amount of followers and they have to start a second account or a third Mm -hmm. account. And it's like, I don't really understand the, it seems very volatile as a platform. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm on the account I have now is my second account because oh, the first account I started, I guess maybe a year and a half ago where like, like when you initially register, you can use your Instagram account, like as your registration. So I was like, that's easy. I'll do that. And then I joined and didn't really use it that much. And then, then more recently I started wanting to use it again, but they said, Oh, sorry, we don't, work with Instagram anymore. So if you registered through that, through that, then you're just, you're just screwed and you lost your, <laughs> you lost your username and everything. And so, oh wow, like, okay. And then I've been having trouble trying to get that fixed. So, so yeah, I just started another account. <laughs> and so I've just been posting from that from, with TikTok, I, I gave it a try because it seemed like it's not that I want to go viral or anything, but it seemed like it's, it's easier to go viral on TikTok or just it's easier to just randomly get a lot of views for a post, whereas opposed to like mm-hmm. others like Instagram or Twitter is just so buried in the algorithm that it's so hard to, to just for anyone to even see the post. Where with TikTok, it's just kind of more random like that. Yeah, TikTok is a lot buzzier in that respect. Like even your your for you page, how it to me it's it's very much akin to like like as I'm scrolling on my phone, it kind of feels like I'm channel surfing with a remote, like. You just go from like video to video. Here's the next one. Here's the next yeah. one. Here's the next one. And it, of course, the algorithm changes up. So you may be watching cleaning videos and then all of a sudden now <laughs> it's on like thirst traps. And then now all of a sudden it's doing like <laughs> poor extractions. Like, I don't know. Like my <laughs> for you page is like all over the place. Cause like you'll like a video and then I guess the algorithm thinks, Oh, well, you must want to see more of this. I'm like, eh, not really, yeah, but I, I liked see. that video. Not all of these other videos. I have a hard time. I've been using TikTok because it's like, well, that's, I feel like, well, let me at least be on there and see, you know, see what happens. But yeah, I, I have a hard time consuming on TikTok because, yeah, it just that is just, it's just too much for me because, I mean, you kind of need to have the sound on and then like, it's, it's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like, okay, just shut up, you know? <laughs> and, and then like sort of talking about that regulation, like sometimes you'll make a video and then the sound like, TikTok will decide to just mute the sound. So oh, no. it's like, okay, so now your video's up, but it doesn't 
have sound <laughs> and what it seems to be like, I don't know. Like, I mean, I've been on the web for like 20 plus years, so I've seen bad comments. TikTok has the worst comment section I have ever seen anywhere across any platform, probably similar to 4chan in terms of like how much people try to like get a rise out of you. Cause what I see from TikTok is like, certainly you have people that are creating videos, but then you have an equal amount of people creating reactions to bad comment videos. Like oh, wow. someone will leave some really like shitty comment. And then now the response to that has gone viral. And it seems like going viral on TikTok is a nightmare because of course that video will get shared out on other platforms and stuff like mm-hmm. that and just invites all kind of stuff. But TikTok yeah. is a, is a very interesting place. I'm strictly a consumer. I'm like, I don't know if I want to put anything on TikTok. Like I'll just watch it. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, we'll see. I, I, I'll post occasionally I'll post some of my art process videos, but when one day, a few months ago, I was like, let me, I've got a new pair of uh, Jordan sixes. And I was like, let me post it on TikTok. And that did better than any of my art videos. So I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Like it's, it's weird about the stuff that will go viral. Like it's, it's hard to kind of predict that on that sort of concept around exposure you know i think we're starting to see a lot more black fine artists and their work being exhibited to the mainstream like i'd say probably over the past like decade or so we've got kahinde wiley who did barack obama's official portrait that's in the national portrait gallery amy sherald also did michelle obama's portrait that's in the national portrait gallery you've got of course a lot more black run television shows and movies and things like that that are also utilizing the work of black artists like the one that sticks out to me just off the top of my head is Luna. I think her name is Luna Victor Iris, who did like all this like intricate kind of gold work stuff that Kendrick Lamar used in his video with SZA. This was years and years ago. But like you're also yeah. seeing like television shows like Empire did a lot with showcasing black artists. Your art has even been shown on like a television show on the First Wives Club on BT. Like, what do you think about, like, that kind of exposure? Like, does it really help you out as an artist? I don't know. I did have some of my work in, in a scene on the first Wives Club. Initially, I mean, that was just cool to just even, to just have that happen. It's like, cool to see your work on a show. As far as exposure from that, I don't know. Like, I, I definitely, because honestly, I didn't get credit for it. I mean, as far as, like, I don't, I don't get, like, a credit at the end of the show or anything. So there's really no my art was not mentioned in the script or anything. So really for a viewer, they wouldn't have no idea whose art it was if I hadn't posted about it, you know, on my social media. So I don't know if it, in my situation, if if it helped with disclosure, I don't know if it, if it had been something different, if it would have helped. I have something, something coming up for another project in the future where my art will be on on something again. And, but this will be like with an actual, this will be a, a movie through Sony I don't know, like, with that, I don't know, again, like, if provide any exposure for me or if, if this was just decoration for the background. Yeah, I don't know. I, I definitely don't, I don't think that I've gotten any, like, direct exposure or, or opportunities from that. So, I don't know. I don't know if it's different for other artists, but I can just say, hopefully, in those situations, the artist is always, you know, treated fairly. Because you mentioned the the Black Panther situation. I don't have, like, all the... the facts in front of me but i remember re- reading a while back like the artist was asked to like hey could we use your visuals for this and i think she was open to it but i'm not sure with the negotiations like it wasn't i guess the terms weren't you know what she wanted so she said no and then so they decided just to go ahead and have another artist make work that's just similar to hers oh and just, and just use it anyway and i think she she filed a lawsuit but i don't think she came out on top on the lawsuit. I think that they said, well, they can, it's not the same, you know, so they can do this. So that would suck. you know. So hopefully that doesn't ever happen to me. Yeah, no, I'm looking, I'm looking at it up now and I, I missed, uh, spoke her name earlier. It's Lena Iris Victor. And yeah, it was yes. uh, Kendrick Lamar and SZA had the video that was, uh, I think it was All the Stars. I think that was the song that was on the yeah. Black Panther soundtrack. But to point out what you said earlier around attribution, I I mean, I think that's the most important part because you see these visuals and they're kind of in the background. And unless there's something in the script or in the credits that's like artwork done by blank, you don't really know unless you know the artist. Like, 
Yeah. You could you could look at you know and because you know different artists have their uh, unique styles. You know we've had fine mm-hmm. artists on the show before, like Doctor Fahamu Peku, etc. And so you if you know the art, then you know the style. But it's sort yeah. of like does the average person watching the show know that? And like it's clear that it doesn't feel like the show has a responsibility, or maybe the movie or whatever doesn't have a responsibility to even like illuminate that, which is pretty sad yeah, they, especially from black don't. from black works yeah a while back um that was um beverly hills cop came on and there was like there's like a scene where they're in a, a gallery and then i noticed in the credits of the movie they, they listed all the artists whose work was shown in that gallery scene so i was like see that that's what i would rather have happen but yeah um, but i guess it's just really up, up to the artists you know if, if they're comfortable with you know the terms that are you know that are presented there mm-hmm. Because, I mean, certainly, like, if, if a television show or something ran and the actors didn't get any attribution, like, you know, people would be raising hell. So, exactly. you know, maybe it's a maybe it's a thing where more artists need to speak up. I don't know. I mean, I'm not yeah, I'm not maybe. pointing this out as like a, a problem that artists need to solve, because clearly if the production companies and such are seeking out and using the art, then it should be up to them to kind of then go the extra step of making sure that that artist gets credited. But. I hope that more, especially from black creatives, I hope to see more of that kind of, I don't even want to say reaching back. Like that feels weird to even say, but like when I, when I look at say Issa Rae and what she's doing with Insecure or, Mm -hmm. or what other showrunners are doing with other shows like that, like it's clear that representation matters, having these images matters. And that's whether it's the image of a person or the image of like artwork, Mm -hmm. it should be, you know, at least attributed so people know kind of that it's not just black folks behind the scenes and black folks that are acting, but like, this is black art on the walls and these are the artists that you should know who they are and support them and stuff like that. Yeah, I I definitely agree with that. That's something that I hadn't really thought about much. I don't think I've really gotten anything directly from that. So what do you want people to see when they look at your work? I want people to, to feel inspired. I want them to see strength. I want them to see power. The other day, you know, I did. A, you mentioned the the YouTube video I did about anxiety. Someone had made a comment like like that they were surprised to hear that I felt that way because when they saw my work, they felt they saw someone that that was empowered. And so I was thinking, yeah, that's I guess that is the case. But but I may not always feel empowered myself, but I, I would like that to come through in my art. There's an article that I saw that was about, it was the same one that we're going to link in the show notes that was regarding your burden of respectability exhibit. But in that article, your work is described as a pursuit to the expansion of herself. How has your work changed as you've grown just as a woman? For me, when I initially started doing portraits um, when, I, when I was younger, for me, you know, I wanted to be at least somewhat realistic. So I needed a reference image to look at. So initially I started just drawing from images and magazines or, you know, cha- you know changing it to, to my own, changing this photo to like a drawing or a painting that, that's in my own vision. And at one point, like just for example, like I would go through a fashion magazine because I love looking at, looking at fashion and I would take this painting of a, a photo of a, of a white model and then make it into a whole new painting of a black woman. And then, then over time I started being able to get my own reference photos and just learn how to shoot and, be able to create from that so then i started you know just painting these portraits of different different people in different colors that I felt were right for the for the image but then over time you brought up you know giving myself permission to be an artist and this and i think i've also started to give myself permission to experiment more and try new materials as i grow i'm going to be tr- just trying new things and just kind of filling out what works and and what doesn't and and just just continue to to evolve. Like for example, like even like using the Kool Aid as a medium. Like in the past, I never would have thought about using like a a food related item as as an art medium. So like ultimately, I just want to be able to just be somewhat play, playful with with some of what I do because it makes it more fun. And experimentation is a very big part of growing for me. How do you get your creativity back if you're feeling uninspired? So yeah, if I, when I'm uninspired, if I just sink into that and do nothing, then it just leads to more of doing nothing and then feeling, feel just feeling worse. 
so really the the best thing for me to do is when I'm feeling uninspired is still just to just work on something just even if it's if it's small just something something low pressure because I may not feel inspired but then once I get into whatever I'm working on then my it just it feels like it activates a part of my brain where I start to get a little bit more inspired and even with what I'm working on I may think of a new idea and try something new and then then at the end of the day I've, I've worked on something I've worked through this creative slump even if I didn't come out with a whole great brand new idea, at least, at least I was working towards it, and so I, I feel better, you know, about myself overall. But sometimes it's been easier said than done. But I've been better about that lately. Just trying, just trying to work through those moments of, of low inspiration. Are there any artists out there that you really like that help inspire you? And they don't have to be visual artists. It could be any sort of artist. One of my first artist inspirations was. Andy Warhol, and that that's because he's one of the first artists I learned about you know, when I was in high school, and I was just I was drawn to how he was kind of like a, I guess eccentric, and um, I like the way he used color and the way that he did the solid backgrounds, and so that's initially kind of what got me started on doing my work the way that I do. Another artist that I find inspiration on uh, from is Wangechi Mutu. Her work is just so um, so earthy. A couple of years ago, she had a, a solo show here in Austin at, at a museum, and and she had these like high heels that were covered in mud, and but it was just so so beautiful and so organic at the same time. So I like to so for so for my own art that I ideally it would be cool to combine bright unnatural colors with also but with also like an organic look or feel as well. So. So yeah, those are two of my inspirations. Who have been some of the mentors that have helped you out along your artistic career? One of the mentors, William Cordova, he's a, a visual artist. He's really the first person from like the art world that really, I guess, like validated me and you know, and, and saying just letting me know that like I don't have to have that MFA and that you know what I'm doing is is good enough. Like as an artist, like I, I could actually do this, you know, and be taken seriously. And then he he introduced me to Robert Pruitt, who is from Houston. Robert has been a mentor, you know, encouraged me early on. And then I think he moved to New York. But you know, every now and then, if he'll see something good to apply for, he'll send it my way. And then last year, he curated a show at his at the gallery that he works with in Seattle, um, Copa del Rio, and he he brought some of my work in, into that show and it that really went really well. The, the work sold and the gallery was like, you, you know, you got any more? And like, sure. You know, I sent some more. And then finally it got to where, you know, now me, I'm working with, with that gallery and, and that's why I have the solo show with them now. And so, you know, that's thanks to the help of, a, you know, fellow artist, Robert Pruitt. What are you obsessed with right now? What, what am I, what am I obsessed with right now? I would say uh, right now I'm obsessed with this with this Kool Aid because it's I'm really, <laughs> I'm really having fun with um, playing with the te- the textures um, and there, there's just so, so much you can there's so much you can do with that to where you know like you can make it where when it dries it still has a kind of a, a bumpy texture to it and like a little bit of a glimmer from like the the chemical crystals you know, that they put in there and so I, I still want want to ex- explore that some more and to see what else can be can be done with that as a medium with the the red kool-aid that you're using is it cherry or tropical punch the red has been i've actually used both the red i've used tropical punch and cherry and then the the watermelon is kind of like a more of a you know pinkish red (laughs) oh i didn't even think about watermelon okay that makes sense do you have like a a dream project that you love to do one day one thing, one thing that I've always wanted to do and is be able to just travel to different parts of the world and just meet and work amongst the artists there. Like, like for example, like Lagos, I would love to be able to, to go there and spend some time and work with the artists there and also uh, maybe even meet, meet people who are part of like the, the punk community there and, you know, maybe create create Im- images, create um, paintings of those people. And I don't know, it's always envisioned like, going to different parts of the world and um, painting porches of, of, you know, some of the people I meet there. How do you see this next chapter 
of your career going? Like, say it's the next five years from now. Like, what kind of work do you want to be doing? That's something that that I'm, that I'm, that I'm currently cr- trying to figure out because I I love having paintings out there in, in the world and having shows with with that work. And I definitely want to con- continue having the shows, but I think I could see myself maybe having a show of paintings, like maybe maybe once a year, and then um, the rest of the year just just working on just different projects that you know that I might be be interested in i'm not you know i'm not sure what that would be or, or what that would would look like but i would definitely it would definitely be be less just getting ready for the next show <laughs> which is you know kind of like how, how things are for me for me right now mm. well just to kind of you know wrap things up here where can our audience find out more about you and your work and and follow and support you and everything online yes i'm, I'm most active on instagram instagram and there i'm at dawn okoro on Twitter, I'm also at Don Okoro. And then on TikTok, I'm Don Okoro underscore official. Um, and I also have a a, a vlog on, on YouTube called Life and Art. And that's where I just where I share just some of the stuff I have um, going on, um, you know, just work, working as an artist. All right. Sounds good. Well, Don Okoro, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. I mean, of course, one for sharing your story and sort of talking about the themes and things behind the work that you do, but also showing that like, it's possible to be a successful working artist. I think, you know, as I sort of alluded to earlier in the conversation around, you know, this great resignation period that's going on right now, I think people need to see more success stories of folks getting out there and making it on their own. And certainly with the the powerful work that you're creating. And now that you're going to have the capacity to do this full time, I'm just really excited to see what you'll have coming up next. So thank you so much for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Yeah. Th- thanks for having me. And yeah, I'm looking forward to the future. Big, big thanks to Don Okoro. And of course, thanks to you for listening. You can find out more about Dawn and her work through the links in the show notes at revisionpath.com. And of course, thanks to our wonderful sponsor, Brevity & Wit. Brevity & Wit is a strategy and design firm committed to designing a more inclusive and equitable world. They accomplish this through graphic design, presentations, and workshops around IDEA, inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility. If you're curious to learn how to combine a passion for IDEA with design, check them out at brevityandwit.com. Brevity and Wit, creative excellence without the grind. Revision Path is brought to you by Lunch, a multidisciplinary creative studio in Atlanta, Georgia. This podcast is created, hosted, and produced by me. Yes, me, Maurice Cherry, with engineering and editing by RJ Basilio. Our intro voiceover is by Music Man Dre, with intro and outro music by Yellow Speaker. So what did you think of the interview? Better yet, what do you think about the podcast overall? We love to hear from you on social media. Please hit us up. Do not be a stranger. We're on Twitter. We're on Instagram. Just search for Revision Path, all one word. Or leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. Or if you're on Amazon Music, leave us a rating and review there too. We'll read it out here on the show. Let everyone you know know about the show because it really helps us grow. I mean, we're we're an old show. Like, we're coming up on nine years in February. That's a long time in podcasting, particularly for a specific kind of niche like this. So if you don't know somebody that has heard of Revision Path, let them know about it. Help spread the word. Helps us reach people all over the world. As always, thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you next time.